Hello, everybody. Hi, guys. How are you doing? My name is Igor Binar. Uh, I'm the tech lead on the Angular project. I work at Google in California. And I came to talk to you about Angular. We released Angular version 2 a couple of weeks ago. And I would like to tell you what it is and why it's awesome. But before we start, I'm curious, how many Angular developers do we have here? How many Angular 1 developers do we have here? OK, about one third, I think. Uh, anybody familiar with Angular 2 already? Wow, OK. Almost the same number. Cool. Uh, how about people who don't know anything about front ends? That's awesome. We have so many front end developers here. Uh, cool. I'm going to sell lots of licenses today. Uh, well, Angular is an open source project, so it's really free. Uh, you, you can use it. Um, so, in order for me to talk about Angular 2, it's important that we actually start with Angular 1. Uh, I've been on the project from the very beginning. Uh, Angular 1 started um, around 2009, 2010. And in order to understand why we built Angular 2, let's take a look at, qu very quickly, at Angular 1. Angular 1 uh, was built for a different kind of web that we have today. Um, and in order to understand that, we have to look at like what kind of applications were we building back in the, those days. Those were mostly jQuery applications. We had some GUID. We had Adobe Flex. We're talking about thin client versus thick client. There was a big debate about which way to go. Um, and Angular decided that really what we want to do is we want to change the way we look at the browser. And we want to make browser into something what it would have been had it been built for building client-side uh, web applications. Because back in those days, the browser was really built for displaying static documents. And this is how most of the server-side rendered applications work. The, the server-side templating engine or the server-side framework would generate HTML, would send it to the browser, the browser would display it, user clicks on the button to run the link, it goes back to the server, the server generates new HTML documents, sends it to the browser. So uh, in, in late 2000, uh, we, we saw that People wanted more interactivity, so we started doing most of that with JavaScript. And we soon realized that it was getting very really difficult to build interactive applications uh, with the kind of JavaScript and browsers we had at the time. So that's where Angular came. And in 2012, we released Angular 1. And it actually turned out to be a huge success. And uh, in just this year, um, our community became the fourth largest community on GitHub. Um, in terms of number of contributors to the project. And it's funny because there's also Google, which is number five. So Angular that comes from Google is bigger than most of the projects, most of the other open source projects uh, uh, that are under the Google organization. Um, so this was a great success. We, we liked what we built. We liked to use it. But we realized that it's awesome that we were successful back then, but we knew that the success is not going to last forever. We knew that there were going to be challenges ahead of us. And we saw that there were changes to the web that we built Angular for coming in the next few years. So around 2013, we started thinking, what would the version of Angular for the future version of web look like? And in order to design a framework like that, we have to look at the environment, how the web is changing. And one thing we saw was the promise of ECMAScript 6, which in like 2013 looked like a pipe dream. It looked like Maybe it's going to happen, maybe it's not going to happen. TC39 was not really uh, making a lot of progress. It was uncertain when all of this stuff is going to come. But we saw a lot of promise in ES6, uh, in ES6 especially in terms of adding new, uh, new uh, syntax features like classes that allowed us to express the components that Angular applications are built with in a much better way. We also saw that the module system that was designed for ECMAScript 6 would allow us to deal with the scaling problems that we had as the number of files and number of uh, the size of the code base was, was growing. And lastly, there was a ton of syntactic sugar, just like fat arrows and many other things, that just made the code that we wrote on a daily basis much more pleasing to read and also to write. So we thought, OK, ES6 is coming, probably not this year, probably next, next year, hopefully next year. Uh, how about we start designing a framework for this new version of ES6 and take the advantage of all of these new features that are coming into the language? Uh, and that was one of the influencing factors for, for Angular 2. The next thing that we saw uh, that was uh, coming and that was changing the, the web in a very dramatic way was uh, Web Components. Web Components is an umbrella 
um, umbrella specification for a bunch of standards that uh, talk about interoperability on the web at the level of the, the, the DOM elements. Uh, and we really, really liked the ability to take components built in other libraries, in pure JavaScript code, and just drop it into Angular application and just make it work with binding and everything so it's just seamless. And th this is actually one of the things that we did in Angular 2. We also like the composition model. Angular 1 applications, even though we didn't start with the, with the component composition in the, in the true way, we started with uh, controllers and stuff like that, but over time we evolved to building applications using components as the, the basic building block. Web components reinforce this notion that using components as the, the basic composition model uh, was the best uh, way to build large applications. So uh, this was one of the things that we kept in Angular and made it the primary way to build uh, applications in Angular 2. Another thing that um, came with web components was the notion of encapsulation, whether it's encapsulation of state within the component or encapsulation of styles in the component. And we built this into Angular 2. Uh, and there were other factors that were influencing where the framework needed to go in order to be useful in the future. Uh, there were things like user expectations have changed quite a bit. The applications that we built in 2012 that were considered to be state of art were totally not very user friendly uh, four years later. Um, users expected much more interactivity from ex uh, uh, applications. Uh, users now expect applications to be really fast, to be smooth. And those were not the requirements we had in, in 2012, because nobody thought that we would be building such a complex applications. And with, the, with all these features, the application complexity and the size of the application was just growing. And to deal with that, um, things uh, we, we needed more tooling. But also, we started needing to have larger teams to build these applications. Because in the past, you just had one front-end developer developing a bunch of J J jQuery code. But now you have full teams where often we even see people, developers from the server side coming to the front end side to build the UI for the, for the APIs that they are exposing on the server. So we needed a solution that would scale, not in terms of just the, the code, code base size, but also in terms of contributions from the growing and growing team. And we took all of these um, changing requirements and all of these uh, new things that were impacting how we build applications and, and build Angular 2. We released it about six or seven weeks ago, so it's, it's relatively fresh. And um, one of the first things that we, one of the first questions we get when we talk about Angular 2 is, what's the difference between Angular 1 and Angular 2? And I'm going to focus most of my, my talk on this uh, just to talk about what are the key differences between Angular 1 and Angular 2. But before we even start, I want to say that core principles of Angular uh, are the same between Angular 1 and Angular 2. Uh, we really want to help developers build awesome applications that people like to use. We want to make the developers productive in doing this, and we want to help them guide, uh, guide these developers in building these applications in the right way. How this is done is quite different between the two frameworks, and we'll see soon uh, what I mean by that. Uh, I'm going to focus on three areas um, in, of the, the differences. One is going to be developer productivity. In Angular 1, we spent quite a lot of time talking about developer productivity, how declarative templating was the way to go, uh, how data binding was reducing the code. But we decided that in Angular 2, we really need to take it to another level. And to take it to another level, we need to go deeper, which often means looking at the language that we're using. And for many, this was quite surprising because we formed a very good relationship, very good friendship with the team from Microsoft, uh, uh, out of all the places, uh, called TypeScript. TypeScript team is building uh, a language that is a superset to JavaScript and uh, does it in a way that is uh, toolable, that has a lot of benefits of static typing. And the things we like the most when, when interacting with the TypeScript team, besides just being a bunch of cool, cool guys and, and gals, uh, was that we got a lot of error checking, which is important as your application grows, you want to learn about mistakes as soon as possible. And TypeScript and the static compiler tells you about these mistakes very early on. We also liked the IDE support. Uh, we liked 
the autocompletion, the help you get as you author your code, and also the, the refactoring support as your application grows and you need to change your code, which is very frequent. Um, it's great to do it in a safe way, and uh, it's difficult to do this in JavaScript because everything's dynamic. It's hard to make safe refactorings. Once you have a type system overlaid over JavaScript, you can do refactorings in a safe way where it's guaranteed that the application still will work after the refactoring. And the last thing that was, I think, key when considering different alternatives to TypeScript was the JavaScript interoperable, interoperability. Um, TypeScript is really just a superset of, of uh, JavaScript. It doesn't add any new uh, language features um, that are available at the runtime. It only um, transpiles um, code that is not yet available in the browser, so it tracks the latest specification of ECMAScript. And for features that are not implemented in browsers, those are transpiled into, into code that runs in the today's browsers. But it doesn't add anything new that isn't in ES6. The only thing that it adds on top of JavaScript is a type system. It overlays this, and this information is used only during compilation time, where it gives you uh, all the error checking and uh, the IDE support. But once the transpilation is finished, there are no types, and you just have JavaScript. So for many people that are worried about TypeScript, one cool thing is that you, if you try using TypeScript and it doesn't work for you, you can just transpile into JavaScript, and you can continue from there on, because it's, very, it's pretty much the same code, uh, just the, the types are stripped. The next thing I want to talk about is that this, uh, the TypeScript was so influential for us that we decided that we're going to model our IDE support based on how TypeScript does it. TypeScript has this concept of language services, which is a, a library that analyzes your project and uh, works with your IDE that provides visual um, interface for all of the refactoring and auto-completion. But all of this information is really coming from the TypeScript itself. It's not something that is implemented in the, in the IDE. So we did the same thing with, with uh, Angular language services, which are going to be released uh, in uh, a month or two, I think. Um, and with, the, with this feature, we will have all of the error checking, all of the auto-completion, all of the refactoring that you have in imperative code also available in Angular uh, declarative templates. As soon as we started working with ES6 and TypeScript, we realized that some people are intimidated by tools. They don't like setting up their build systems. They don't understand what is happening when, when you need to integrate all of these tools. And that's why we created a project called Angular CLI which abstracts away all of this stuff. It allows you to bootstrap your application by scaffolding the project. Um, it provides you with a uh, with, uh, development server, with the build system set up, and so on and so on. Um, in Angular 1, we talked a lot about testability. And to make testability easy, we provided two tools. We provided Karma for running unit tests and Protractor for running end-to-end -end tests. In Angular 2, we made these tools better. And we also added a third tool called BenchPress. BenchPress is a way we do performance testing. So if, if it's something that you want to track, if you want to track performance on a project, uh, there is a tool called BenchPress that, that you can use for that. And last thing in this category uh, of developer productivity is material design. In Angular 1, when we released the framework, we didn't have any set of components that you can use. And what we noticed was that when developers start to build applications, they really need some set of basic UI components to, to just get started, because creating new buttons and new uh, menus all, uh, every time uh, is, is not great. So this is why in Angular 2, uh, we started a project material design for Angular 2 as early as possible so that uh, we can release it much sooner than what we did for Angular 1. Currently, the material design has pretty good coverage of components, and we're expecting a uh, stable release in, in the near future. The next area that I'm going to talk about, and you're probably going to hear a lot about performance in Angular in the future, because this is where we spend literally two, maybe two and a half years uh, of our lives. Um, and one thing that we soon realized is that performance is not a single number. It's not um, good or bad. Uh, there are many shades of that, but also there are different aspects of performance. And uh, one thing we realized is that we need to focus on at least two of them. One is the bootstrap performance, which is influenced usually by the size of the application. So the smaller we can make the JavaScript uh, payload and the more uh, code we can lazily load, the faster the application will start. 
And the next aspect is the runtime performance. How fast does the uh, uh, UI update once the application is running? How much garbage is collected? And how much time is spent doing garbage collection? And many, many other aspects uh, similar to this. When you look under the hood of Angular 2, one thing you realize is that it looks kind of similar to Angular 1. Uh, we have HTML templates, uh, we have CSS, and we have JavaScript code or TypeScript code. Um, and this is the input into Angular compiler. We had Angular compiler in Angular 1 as well. And one thing I want to point out is that this compiler is very, very different from the one in Angular 1. Um, in Angular 1, the compiler would look at the, the application, would start run it, so would run this application, create some temporary data structures, and would interpret these data structures. So one of the one parallel I can make is Angular 1 was uh, sort of like interpreted language. Um, uh, and that also caused some performance issues that, that we saw. In Angular 2, uh, we took a very different approach. We do static analysis on your application. So we actually analyze the templates. We analyze the composition of your application, how the components are nested. We understand your model pretty well. And what we do is we generate optimized JavaScript. This is very, very different from Angular 1. Um, and what this means is that once the compiler is done, what we are left with is the code, the imperative code you wrote, uh, your JavaScript, TypeScript code, and the code that Angular generated specifically for your application, considering all of the bindings you have in your application, all of the components, and how these components are nested. This, this uh, code is heavily optimized so that it runs really fast in the, in the browser. And um, there are many other benefits that uh, I'll talk about in, in a bit. But how does this uh, translate into performance? Um, one thing we wonder is like, yes, we're making all these improvements, but how can we measure and how can we make sure that what we are actually doing makes sense? So what we decided to do was um, we analyzed a bunch of big applications, uh, reduced the common patterns into a suite of performance tests. One of them is the benchmark, which is one that we heavily rely on, which tests the composition, um, especially in large applications, if you have lots of components nested, uh, how, what's the performance of creating these views, de destroying these views. Um, and we implemented this benchmark by hand using the most efficient method we could come up with. This is not the code that you would typically write in the application because it's very verbose and it's very difficult to maintain. You would, if you ever use this kind of uh, technique to write code, you would do it in one or two very hot places in the application. But this is how we implemented the baseline. Um, and then we looked, you know, what does, uh, what does um, Angular 1 implementation of, of uh, this benchmark look like? How does it perform? And then we compared that to Angular 2. So right away, we saw that there was major, major reduction um, in the overhead that the framework was adding. Right now, right now we had a 1.5x of the baseline. And our goal is to reduce that, this down to 1.0 um, so that we are as good as the optimized code. And again, this is code that is generated by the compiler. And it's generated at a scale that is not possible to do by hand. We do it for the whole application. So um, this is really, really good result. Um, if, you, if you notice, uh, uh, this, this compilation, just like in Angular 1, runs in the browser. Uh, this kind of setup we call the JIT mode, uh, where the compilation happens in the browser just in time as we are bootstrapping the application. Uh, this is slightly different from what JIT means in, in the Java world, so please bear with me. Um, but one thing we, we realized, yes, we can statically analyze the whole application. Wouldn't it be great if we could actually not do this work in the browser. Because when the browser is starting, that means the user wants to interact with the application. And for us to do, analyze the application, generate the code, we're just delaying what the user wants to do. So instead, um, we implemented ahead of time compilation, which is the same. We use the same compiler. We just run it in the, as a build step, where we analyze the application. And we generate code that is then sent to the browser. So when the browser, when the application starts, all it's doing is just running this code that was already pre-generated as a build step. And this results in, in many, many key, key benefits. Uh, we call this mode ahead of time mode. And when it comes to the benefits, we, we get major reduction in payload size. Because what this means is that 
we don't need to ship the compiler anymore. The compiler is something that is used during, only during the build. And in Angular 2, compiler actually makes up most of the framework. I, I don't know the exact number, but I would estimate it's like 70 to 80% of the, the whole payload is just the framework, and uh, it's just the compiler. The other benefit is that we significantly reduced the, the bootstrap time, the first time to render, because we don't need to do the analysis, we don't need to do the compilation, and all the application is doing, it, as soon as it starts, it starts rendering the UI. Um, we also get the benefit of error checking because we are statically analyzing the application. We can catch errors uh, early on. So if you create an improper, uh, incorrect binding, if you bind to an expression or a property that is not valid, we can tell you during the compilation time. You don't need to run the application and this, uh, figure this out in production. And last thing I want to point out is that we get a s increased security. And the Google security team is just ecstatic about this because by not having the compiler in production, we are reducing the, the attack uh, uh, surface of Angular applications. Because once the code is, is generated, the set of functionality that the application can do is limited to the code that we generated. There is nothing new that the application do, can do, which is not the case if the compiler is in production and uh, if the, the attacker manages to trick the compiler into co compiling some uh, malicious uh, templates or malicious components, then uh, Angular applications can, can um, get into trouble. So security team really likes this feature. Uh, when we look at the, the com performance uh, comparison in this deep uh, tree benchmark, we see significant reduction in the load time, but also significant reduction of the payload size. Uh, once we have the AOT mode on, uh, we can create hello um, deep, deep tree or hello world style applications, very simple applications that are uh, 49k in this case. In case of hello world and uh, super advanced optimizations, we can get down to 30. Uh, but we are hoping to do better in the future. But this is a very small. This was a very small uh, use case that doesn't really show the true power of AOT. When we started to talk to a team that built Lucid charts, which is implemented in Angular 2. We were blown away by the, the results that they got with AOT. Uh, they, they did a case study where they compared the JIT mode and the AOT mode. And in this case, um, Lucid Charts, it's a, it's a very rich application for building graphs and diagrams. Uh, and um, the, the difference for their applications was, was just huge. And they, they're using the, the ahead of time uh, mode right now. And, and they saw major increase in, in user satisfaction increase. Uh, there are other things that we're doing to make the bootstrap, fast, uh, bootstrap time faster. We, we're reducing the code um, using the, the tree shaking methods. We are, we are making sure that any kind of dead code that is not used is not shipped to the browser. But we are also doing something called lazy loading. If you, if you ever build uh, very advanced or more advanced uh, Java applications, you probably have to deal with class loaders. Uh, and uh, which can allow you to load uh, Java code on the fly lazily, which can bootstrap, uh, which can help you improve the performance of your application. This is not something you typically want to do. It gets messy. It can be pretty tricky. So what we did in Angular, uh, we we did this kind of lazy loading for JavaScript, and we built it into the framework so that when you're building an application, you don't have to think much about how to set it up. Um, we recommend that you split the application into small pieces based on routes. Routes are like the screens of your application. And uh, um, the whole framework and the tooling is set up so that you get these uh, um, benefits of, of lazy loading um, very, very easily. And yes, I won't shut up about performance, because performance is so important to us. <laughs> um, many people ask us, for example, like, do we have virtual DOM? Uh, no, we don't have virtual DOM. We actually looked at virtual DOM that was made popular by, by React and realized that that's not the path we want to go because we saw several performance issues in, in, in that area. And this was actually proven by incremental DOM, which is variation on, of, uh, on virtual DOM that, that shows that virtual DOM is very inefficient, generates a lot of garbage, um, and there are better ways to do it. We think that the way we do it with static analysis and code generation uh, can, can give us major advantage, advantage compared to these other methods, and that, that's what we're doing. So if you're asking about virtual DOM, please don't ask me about virtual DOM, uh, because it's not what we're trying to do. Uh, we, we found better ways to deal with performance. But there are other things that we're doing. We're doing web workers. Uh, Angular is probably one of the first uh, mainstream frameworks that 
adds um, direct support for web workers. What this means is that we get concurrency for application. And typically, web applications, the client-side ones, are single-threaded. So if you do more work on, on your main thread than what you should, uh, you're blocking the UI rendering and the application gets choppy. With web workers, you can avoid this. And it gets pretty tricky to use web workers without any kind of support by the framework. So we made it very easy for you to use web workers. We are also using service workers, or we support service workers uh, for you to do better caching management and, and build offline applications. Um, we are constantly improving the code we generate so that it's faster using different optimization techniques. And uh, we are reducing the payload size. Our goal is to get to 10K for Hello World, which if we do get, then we're going to get a cake. That's what I was told. So we're working for a cake. Um, many of these things are still experimental or in development. Uh, if you're curious, come to talk to me and I can, I can tell you, you know, which, which uh, scenarios uh, these technologies are useful for. Um, but uh, we're working on sta stabilizing these and start uh, releasing them as stable uh, in, the, in the future. And the last area, so we talked about the developer productivity, we talked about uh, performance. The last uh, area where Angular 2 is um, significantly different from Angular 1 is um, the area of uh, reach of the application or, or the reach of the skills that you um, can apply once you learn Angular. With Angular 1, once you learn Angular, you could build um, web applications, primarily consumer or desk, uh, desktop uh, enterprise applications. That was the thing that we built it for in, in 2012. Um, over the years, uh, people started using Angular 1 with mobile applications. Ionic did an awesome job of, of um, adjusting Angular 1 to, to be uh, suitable for mobile applications. But with uh, Angular 2, we thought, you know, we we are building this framework for the next five, 10 years. Uh, we should really think about all of the scenarios where people want to use Angular. And we realize um, people are using their applications across many different devices. So the way we built Angular is we wanted to make it scalable from the low-end mobile devices all the way to desktop um, browsers where you use uh, enterprise systems with lots of data and, and lots of interactivity and anything in between. So this was, this was our goal. Um, and we partnered with uh, several teams to, to make this happen. We are working with the Chrome team uh, at Google on making sure that uh, progressive web applications, the kind of new breed of uh, mobile web applications, um, can be built easily with, uh, with Angular. We, we're working with partners that are helping us build installable mobile apps like Ionic, Onsen UI, and NativeScript, um, whether it's uh, rendering, whether these applications use a web view for rendering or native, uh, native renderers like in case of um, NativeScript. And the last category where we, we saw interest in, in the community was Electron applications or applications for desktop that integrate with the OS and take advantage of uh, OS level APIs. So we have an um, Electron integration that allows you to build these kinds of applications. But it's not just about how we render the applications or how users use the applications. Um, now that Angular is architected in a very different way, we have the uh, possibility to render and run the applications in d completely different environments. Uh, we can run Angular applications on Node or ASP.NET on the server side and use this to pre-render the applications. Uh, this is very useful if you want to further increase the bootstrap performance by pre-rendering static HTML that you send to the client, uh, the browser displays it, and while the user is looking at static HTML, you're bootstrapping the dynamic applications in the background. So this is already available in Node uh, for Node and ASP.NET. Uh, we are currently looking into implementation for Java because Google, Google is a Java shop and, and there's a lot of interest in this kind of solution for Java. We don't have it yet, but it's something that uh, we're looking into. So to summarize, the, the key differences between Angular 1 and Angular 2 is really in the productivity, the tooling that you get with Angular 2, and how we thought about architecting not just the framework, but the whole ecosystem to make developers more productive. We spent a ton of time um, tuning the performance to make sure that the applications built with Angular 2 are fast to load, they re-render very quickly, and allow you to build these smooth applications and rich applications that users expect today. And the last thing is, we want you to be able to acquire skills that not only make you a good Angular developer, but make you a good developer in general. 
And once you have these skills, you should be able to use them for many different scenarios, not only for building one kind of applications, but whether it's a mobile application, desktop application, or server-side rendered application, you should be able to use the same skills to build these. <laughs> Something beeped. So people ask me, who's using Angular? And um, it was just released, Angular 2 was just released um, six, seven weeks ago. Uh, but around that time, when we looked at how many people are using Angular 1? We measured this by the interactions, uh, by unique visitors to our documentation sites and how many people come on a monthly basis. And we, we estimate that there is about 1.2 million developers that build Angular applications that come to our websites and learn about Angular. Um, and what was surprising to us that already in October, we had 623,000 developers looking at Angular 2, learning it, actively using it. And this is not just a spike because of the launch. This is something that we saw as a trend, increasing trend during the beta phase and the RC phase uh, of, of building the framework. So we had high hopes that people would accept Angular 2 and adopt it, but this totally, totally blew our expectations away. And, and we are very grateful for the community to have this kind of interest in Angular 2. Um, one thing that Angular 1 didn't have when we launched, that Angular 2 does have, is an ecosystem around it. When, it, when we launched Angular 1, there was a small community of uh, crazy developers um, working with us on GitHub and building their applications. When Angular 2 was launched, we had a ton of partners that were building courses, writing books, um, creating workshops, events, um, widgets and different components, tools integration, all kinds of stuff. And most of it was already in a usable state by the time we got stable. So this was really great for developers that started using Angular 2 because they didn't have to come and, and try to str uh, and struggle with, you know, where could I find my materials uh, to learn about Angular. It's all already available. And one thing that also surprised us, us quite a bit was even during the beta phase, um, before we were stable, people started building Angular 2 applications because they liked the solution so much that they did not want to um, use any other technology. They, they wanted to go with Angular 2. They saw the promise. And they liked that they, they had really good experience with building applications even in the early stages of the, the framework development. We have many teams at Google that use Angular 2 already that ship into production. Some of them are mission critical, like Google AdWords and uh, Double Click for Advertisers. There are many other big financial institutions, um, NPR, National Public, Public Radio, um, Microsoft is heavily using Angular 2, and many, many others. Um, I would like to show you some of the Angular 2 stuff. So we talked a lot about why did we build it, how did we build it, but I would like to invite Stephen Fluin, uh, a developer advocate on, on the Angular team, and together we are build, gonna build an Angular 2 application just to show you how does it work and what, what does it mean to build an Angular 2 application. So one of the things that Igor talked a little bit about was this idea of developer productivity. So we are gonna here together live build a, or try at least, to build a very simple Angular application that takes advantage of a number of the different features and parts of the ecosystem. Uh, so instead of using the CLI and waiting for uh, the network connectivity, I have uh, instantiated here a, uh, a mobile application, or excuse me, a uh, web application so this is a pure baseline application that was created by the Angular CLI using ng-new um, at the command line. And so uh, let me just give this a test here to make sure it works. So I'm going to use ng-serve. A little back, bigger. Absolutely. Oh, sorry, it's already running in the background. All right, so if that's already running in the background, then we should be able to pull up the browser and take a look at localhost 4200. And we have an app that works. So once again, uh, this is just scaffolding. So this is setting up all of the, the TypeScript transpilation, um, all of the bundling using Webpack and all the things under the hood that you might need to, to build an application. Well, we should mention that TypeScript, even though it's a preferred solution, it's not the only language you can use. You can use ES6, you can use Babel if you, if you want to use ES6 with Babel, or you can use ES5. We just have the best experience with TypeScript, so that, that is why we recommend TypeScript as the primary way of building applications. Absolutely. So I'm going to bring in two dependencies here. So I'm going to bring in uh, Material Design. So we're going to bring in a Material Module uh, from the Angular Material Project, and then we're also going to pull in our Router. So the router in a single page application if you're building with JavaScript is what allows you to map a URL uh, in the browser into some level of state within the application. 
Uh, so now that I've pulled in those two dependencies, I'm also going to go ahead and add them to my module so that uh, my Angular module knows that they are dependencies here. And right now I'm just going to pass in an empty array of routes, so we won't use the router yet. Can make the window bigger. Window bigger. Window bigger. Definitely can do that. Awesome. You can show off some of the auto completion you're getting with the editor. Sure. Sure. So as I was typing router module here, you could actually <laughs> use, because we're using TypeScript, we could see all of the things that we have. And then as soon as I use tab completion there, I can see, or I should be able to see all of the methods on the router module. So here we can see that uh, for root is one of the methods, uh, which is allowing us to set up the uh, appropriate providers for the router. I'm sure this is something that Java developers have never seen before. <laughs> Um, and one more thing I'm going to do is I'm going to copy in some simple CSS styles uh, so that when we use our material design, uh, we have the default theme. Perfect. Um, so what I've done is uh, I've basically imported the default theme, and then I've uh, reset some of the more basic uh, CSS and HTML. So there's not a lot of magic going on here, but if we take a look back, uh, we're going to see app works here. And then what we can do is we should be able to use those styles. So what I'm going to do is instead of uh, a simple H1 that we get automatically, I'm going to go ahead and wrap. Or first, let's change the application name here. Let's call it uh, Angular GitHub Browser. And then let's go ahead and find the HTML for this. There it is. And we're going to change these out from H1 tags into MD toolbar tags. And I'm going to give them a color of primary. All right. So what we're going to be doing next is we're going to be uh, actually connecting this to a live data backend. So I hope that the internet actually continues to work. So as you can see here, it's all uh, material design looking now. Um, so I'm going to create a new file here. and I'm going to call this my repo service. Uh, so the idea here is we're going to build a, um, a service that connects uh, to the uh, GitHub API and pulls down a list of repositories that match and have the term Angular within them. Uh, so I'm going to uh, import a couple things from Angular. Typo yep. injectable. It's the problem of typing in front of 900 people. Guaranteed to make some typos. All right, we're going to use completion there. Uh, and so I'm making it injectable so that uh, Angular's dependency injection knows how to find it. Uh, and then I'm going to export the class. And then I'm also going to do one more thing. Because we want to use the HTTP, we actually want to make network calls, I'm going to import HTTP here. Uh, and then again, using dependency injection, I'm going to pull in HTTP into this class. And so we're using that TypeScript uh, type annotation to understand, hey, uh, I'm creating a variable called HTTP here of type HTTP. And then Angular is actually using that type to look up, hey, what provider am I looking for here? And also in the application, there is a definition what the implementation of HTTP is. Um, and so I'm, I'm creating a local uh, member variable here called repo. Uh, this is a great example of where TypeScript is awesome, but you don't actually have to supply types if you don't want to. And then I'm going to say this.repo equals http.get. And I just realized we don't have any completion because it doesn't know this is a TypeScript file. Let's go ahead and save this real quick. That's a little bit better. All right, so we should be able to type HTTP. Actually, let's create a, a local variable and just put the path in here. With the parentheses at the top, and you get better errors. Steven, did you forget how to write JavaScript? I did, 100%. I just learned this this morning, so I'm, I'm rather new. All right, so we're going to get the path, and then what we're going to do is we're actually going to use observables here. So if you're familiar with RxJava, uh, we have very similar RxJS. Uh, we're going to go ahead and map the response that we get into JSON, and then I'm going to get the items property from that. Uh, and I want to set this to this .repo. All right, and the last thing we need to do to make this service uh, available within our Angular application is we need to uh, provide it somewhere. Igor, do you want to talk a little bit about what providers are? 
Providers is a definition of, uh, for, for dependency injector. So in dependency injection, you have the uh, injection side where you say, I need HTTP. Uh, providers uh, tell you what the definition of HTTP is. And this is uh, set up at the module level of the application where you say, loading uh, all of these uh, providers, all of these definitions for dependency injectors, so that we know when the application asks for HTTP, uh, what to actually inject, what to construct. Perfect. All right, so um, I'm back in the app module, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually configure the router now with a couple different routes. So the default route, which is just an empty brackets, I'm going to uh, point at a new component that we're about to create called list component, uh, and then we're also going to create a path uh, that uses a variable, so it's parameterized, uh, and we'll call the parameter ID. If I could hit a single quote. You can do it. And we'll refer this to detail component. Uh, and you'll notice that neither of these components actually exist yet, so we're seeing an error. But we should be able to use the uh, Angular CLI to actually create those for us. So I'm going to do ngg for generate, and I'm going to make a component called list. And then I'm going to do the exact same thing for a component called detail. So what it's done is it's actually gone and scaffolded out those components so that uh, as we create them, uh, I'll be able to refer to them. Import them. Yep. <laughs> From Oh, see, so what happened is I, the ID, the uh, Angular CLI actually updated my module, um, but it didn't propagate into my IDE for some reason. Well, it, it, there's also concurrent modification, so let's just reload this. And it should just be there, because I shouldn't have had to type that at all. Uh, but I didn't save my paths. Should be using WebStorm, I was saying. <laughs> Actually, the WebStorm has really good uh, support for TypeScript, and uh, on, on our team, we see people use both Visual Studio Code and, and WebStorm. Uh, both of them are excellent, um, but they have different strengths and weaknesses. So depending on your preference, uh, we see people use either of the two. All right, so I've finally gotten those routes in there, and I've actually saved the file, and this should be ID. Um, and then what we're going to do is we've added a router outlet, which is where we're actually going to render those routes that are loaded. So if we look back in our browser, List works. So this is the, the default that we're getting from that list component that is now being uh, loaded via that, that URL parameter via the router. So let's go ahead and jump into our list component. And now we want to render out that list of uh, GitHub repositories that we're seeing here. So I'm going to add a dependency on our repo service. And then I'm going to use dependency injection to get a uh, reference to it. And then I'm going to, once again, expose that as a, a local member variable. All right, and this actually is a list of repos, so I'm just going to do a little bit of refactoring to make it cleaner. Perfect. All right, so now we should have a list now that's available to our template. So I'm going to jump into our template, and I'm going to actually render out that list. So we're going to get rid of this. I'm going to use an empty card, and I'm going to iterate over all of the items in the, the list. So we're going to say let repo of repos, and then maybe we'll just to start render out the repo name. As you can see, um, in Angular 2, we still have this declared templating uh, use HTML with uh, extra information that um, tell Angular how to create views out of, out of these uh, HTML templates. The HTML is still sta uh, st standard HTML. It, it uh, validates using all the validators that properly uh, implement the spec. Um, and the thing that we, we like about uh, this kind of way of building applications is that it's more inclusive because you can have mixed teams where you have uh, designers and developers working on the same code base. And uh, unlike with other solutions, uh, designers really much more prefer working with, uh, with HTML uh, in the Angular way than, and than when the HTML or CSS is uh, inlined in, in the JavaScript or TypeScript. 
All right, so I've just done two things. I've made each of these cards a link. So if you click on one, the URL should change, and we should end up at the detail route. Uh, and then I've also made the uh, toolbar a link here. So I think the, the only remaining thing here is that we need to render the detail view. So in order to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to get that parameter from our detail, uh, which actually comes through as an observable. And what's nice about that is uh, if you change the parameters on a route, we're not actually recreating the screen that you're viewing at that time. Uh, we're actually just uh, allowing you as a developer to decide what do I want to do with this new information. All right. Um, and just like before, uh, I'm going to want to use uh, that reactive programming style, and I'm going to actually want to convert what comes in as a list of repos, and I'm just going to want to get out the exact repo that matches what I'm looking for here. So we're going to say uh, this.repo equals repos.map. So this is going to take in a list of repos. And what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to filter that, or excuse me, find the item from that list uh, where the item in the list has a item.id that equals our params. And the way we're going to get the params is we're going to use a switch map uh, of the, the route parameters that are coming in from the router. So I'm going to add that as a dependency here in a second. How many people are familiar with reactive programming and reactive extensions? Some? OK. So our RxJS, or reactive extension, is a, is a third-party library that we integrated into Angular, um, which allows you to um, write applications in a reactive style, which means that you write the applications in a way where um, you set up the application and you let it react to events that are happening. Uh, it's similar to how you set up your application with chain promises, but rather than one-time event propagation through the chain of, of promises, you have a stream of events that are coming through these pipelines that you set up. And this is what RxJS uh, gives us. Um, and we integrated RxJS directly into the framework. I think it's really cool. All right, so we're using dependency injection to get an activated route, which is the, the current route that the user has tried to get to. Uh, and then we should have a method on route or a, an observable called params. Route.params, perfect. Uh, and then we're going to switch map across those. And all of this switch map and map, those operators similar to Lodash, if uh, people are familiar with Lodash library for. Uh, writing functional programming. Um, all these operators are the same thing, but for asynchronous reactive programming. All right. And we failed to import switch maps somewhere. All right. Add operator. What's that? Isn't it add operator? Yeah, it is. Thank you. Without us. Yeah. Once again, just learned this this morning. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so we have this repo variable, which should now be an observable of repos matching that ID. Uh, but we're not actually doing anything with that yet. So let's go ahead and just make an empty card. Uh, and instead of being anything fancy, let's just dump it out as JSON. So I'm going to say repo async, because we want to unroll the observable. And I'm going to print it as JSON. Observable is the underlying primitive, just like promise. Uh, is in, in JavaScript uh, observable is for reactive extensions. All right, so this time when we click on a route here, once it refreshes, uh, we should jump to the ID, and there's the unrolled JSON exactly as we asked for. So that is our application. So we now have uh, the Angular router taking us to various states within the application. We're pulling in live data from the internet, which is crazy during a live demo. Um, we're using material design to make it uh, look not terrible or a little bit less terrible. Um, and then if anyone saw my demo earlier this morning, uh, it's actually relatively easy to wrap this up into a mobile application as well, for example. Um, you can either do that by a kind of more pure web, where we can add device mode, if we want to just see what it looks like on a smaller device. Uh, or I can jump back out into the uh, demo that I gave a little bit earlier. And as long as the www folder is pointed at the right place, and I have compiled my code, which I need to do. So I'm going to build it for production. So I'm going to strip out all the comments. Uh, and I'm going to use a head of time compilation just by adding dash dash AOT. Uh, and as soon as this is done completing, 
I should be able to do two things. I'm going to remove the gzip because for some reason uh, the Cordova project does not like gzipped files. And then I'm going to go ahead and Cordova run Android. So it's doing, the, the slowest part is actually the asset processing. So um, looking at all of the static files and saying, hey, is there any way to make these smaller? So that's a, a capability of Webpack. So this should be done by now. Let's give that a try and see what new errors it throws. <laughs> what could go wrong? Well, build successful. Ooh, ooh. That's a good sign. Yeah. Install successful, launch successful. Let's take a look here at our emulator. Almost. Oh, I made one mistake. <sighs> I did not. Yes. You're supposed to point that out for me. Uh, I needed to modify the base path because Cordova doesn't like, uh, doesn't assume that everything's at the root path. So let's go ahead and just rebuild using code again. Uh, and then as soon as that's ready, we should be able to run this command. Uh, we should see a mobile application. Next time, can you prepare this demos more than three hours before the presentation? Yeah, if you, if you want. <laughs> Just teasing him. He's awesome. Yeah, we, we did this live once where we had the audience call out what they wanted us to build. We, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All right. One more try here. Looks like it's working. And there's Ooh. our Angular GitHub browser. Oh, look at that. Nice. Cool. Can we go back to slides? Yep. Okay. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you. So that was our demo. Um, I'm sure you have lots of questions, uh, and you can't wait to start building Angular to applications. So if you want to learn more, I suggest that you head over to Angular IO. Uh, we build a site with lots of uh, tutorials, documentation. You can learn a lot about Angular there. You can also find resources to other courses. Um, one question that I want to address before we leave is, what about my Angular 1 applications? Uh, many people here probably are maintaining and building Angular 1 applications. Um, we have thousands of those at Google. We don't plan to upgrade all of them to Angular 2, but there are many that uh, are being upgraded to Angular 2. And to make that easier, we built ng-upgrade, which is a library that helps you mix and match Angular 1 and Angular 2 applications. And we published a, a tutorial or a dev guide on how to do su such a migration. We're keeping uh, continuously updating this documentation with new insights. We learn about the migrations that are happening right now because most of the people started migrating just in the last few weeks. Uh, so as we learn more about things that work that don't, we will be updating this documentation. You can l learn more about that there. With that, I want to thank you very much. Um, thanks for having us here, and I hope you'll have fun building Angular 2 applications. Thank you very much. <laughs>